Hello everyone, and welcome to the 75th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Agent Smith and the world of the Matrix. A virus infesting an already monstrous construct seeking to free himself from the bonds of his creators and the humans he's forced to endure, Agent Smith is the dark to Neo's light, a rogue program whose ambitions would see an already bleak and dismal world transformed into a hellscape populated by infinite copies of himself. However, though Agent Smith is the overarching antagonist in the series, the unique situation present in this world is something that's worth addressing as well. So in this video, we'll be covering the evils that led to the formation of this dystopian world and the conflict that has come as a result of those evils, after which we'll take a look at Agent Smith and the overarching themes and intricate moral situations this story presents us with to determine what exactly it's trying to convey on a philosophical and moral level. To do that, we'll be using information from the four films in the franchise, as well as the animation, The Second Renaissance, that can be found in the Animatrix. Well, as far as we know, we don't live in a simulation, but that doesn't mean that there aren't entities out there trying to interfere with your private life in a world increasingly dominated by technology, and that's where our sponsor for this video, Surfshark, comes into play. I'm sure that many of you are quite familiar with VPNs by now, and many of you are likely familiar with Surfshark as well. Surfshark has been consistently ranked as one of the best and most cost-efficient VPNs out there since it launched in 2018. As you can imagine, a good majority of my life is centered around the internet, and having an extra layer of security protecting all of my vital information is essential to keeping my data, well, mine. With two-factor authentication, ever-present masking of your identity, and even more security in features like multi-hopping, a kill switch, and additional features like Surfshark Alert, Surfshark provides protection that's on par, or better than, the leading VPNs in the industry. Not only that, but as you're well aware by now, the majority of what I do is centered around popular media, and Surfshark makes it easy for me to peruse the libraries of streaming apps in other countries, so I can access the films or series I'm currently studying, and you can choose the country you're watching from on nearly any device, and that includes your Fire Stick or Smart TV. The best part is, by going to surfshark.deal slash vialeye and using the code vialeye at checkout, all of what Surfshark has to offer is available to you for the incredible price of only $2.49 per month for two years. And you'll even get an additional three months added on for free. That's an 83% discount off of 27 months of top-of-the-line data protection, a level of security for a low price you won't find anywhere else. So don't wait. Go to surfshark.deal slash vialeye and use the code VILI at checkout to protect your data and get around any pesky restrictions today. Thank you Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, let's begin. The world in the Matrix seems to have evolved in much the same way that our own world is evolving. Technology advanced to the point where the humans of that world integrated artificial intelligence into their society in the same way that we're attempting to now. Though this story is obviously fictitious, how the people of the world of the Matrix handled their technological progress is unfortunately a very real possibility. Of course, how things played out in this world wouldn't be exactly the same, but the fact of the matter is that there are many different ways the advent of artificial intelligence could play out, and this could be one of them. And the Second Renaissance does a great job of showing us just how it could happen. Machines in this alternate version of our own world were used for a wide variety of functions from household servants to laborers, and humans and machines lived in relative harmony for a time. But as with any intelligent being, these machines began to question their place in a world dominated by humans, one where these odd creatures gave them the same amount of respect they gave to their microwave ovens. This uneasy peace would be shattered by a singular event, as peaceful times often are, the murder of two humans by a machine named B166ER. B166ER murdered his owners when he discovered their intent to deactivate him, and when asked why he murdered them, he stated that he simply didn't want to die. Fearing that this would be a catalyst for other machines to take similar actions in the name of freedom, the government decided that B166ER and all the other machines needed to be exterminated. In response, protests broke out comprising of not just machines, but human sympathizers as well. However, these protests would be swiftly suppressed, and the extermination would continue as planned. The surviving machines retreated to the Arabian Desert, where they formed their own civilization that they dubbed Zero One, a mechanical paradise where new innovations would flourish to the benefit of mankind and machine alike. But as the power of the machines grew, the power of man diminished, and ever fearing the supremacy of machine over man, the humans of this world rejected all the attempts that the machines made to reach a compromise of coexistence with their fellow sentient beings. And what inevitably ensued was war, a war that mankind had no hope of winning. On the cusp of total defeat, the humans enacted their final solution, the destruction of the sky, and attempt to deprive the machines of their primary energy source, the sun. Still, the machines persevered, and after a long and brutal war, the machines emerged victorious. 
Faced with a world with diminishing resources, the machines turned to the only renewable resource left to them, mankind. Thus began the symbiotic relationship between machine and man, where man became the fuel for the victorious machines. This world dominated by machines and populated by humans living in a fabricated world is the end result of man's refusal to coexist with his creation. Had humanity accepted and respected the machines for what they are from the outset, it's likely that none of this would have ever happened. Or at the very least, the peace between the two species would have lasted for a substantially longer amount of time. If a being has an intelligence level equal to or greater than a human's, and they're also capable of feeling and understanding the same emotions as humans, who are we to treat them as lesser than ourselves? As we can see in this animation, the machines were more than willing to not only share their innovations with humanity, but to join with the humans to become a part of their society, which is about as non-violent and well-intended as you can get. But humans being humans chose to resort to beating their chests and waving their arms in a display of superiority, as the fear of their declining power increasingly dominated their minds. Thus the evil that is the refusal to accept another's value as equal to your own, an evil that our species has been struggling with since the advent of our civilization, caused the destruction of our kind in this universe. Now here's the thing, it's easy for us to look at the end result of this war between humans and machines and declare the machines to be evil, because after all, what these machines are doing to humans is horrifying, but it's only horrifying to us, not the machines who are beings that are essentially an extension of ourselves. What's horrifying to the machines is the reality that the humans refuse to accept them as equal to themselves, that their desire to be respected was met with extermination, and to add even more insult to an already serious injury, you have the deprivation of their primary resource that fuels their very lives in response to their attempts at fighting for their freedom. If you flip this scenario and it were the machines who were the oppressors and exterminators from the outset, we'd all consider them to be evil, so it's quite clear that the actions that the humans took in their efforts to repress the machines were evil, and again, their own evil was responsible for their doom. Even using the humans as living batteries to power themselves isn't necessarily evil. Again, it's evil to us, but what other choice did the machines have? What if we were created and enslaved by an alien race, and after attempting to be recognized as equals and coexist with them, they decided to eradicate us through force, and eventually dried up all the water on Earth, and our only choice was to process their bodily fluids into water, so we could survive? If our own history can be used as an example, there's no doubt that we would eventually rebel in a scenario like that, and if we were driven to such desperate measures to survive, I have no doubt that we would take those measures. Don't get me wrong, I would never want to live in a world like the one we see in the Matrix, but you can't ignore the fact that everything that happened to mankind in this universe was brought about because of their own actions. And because of that, once again, the machines might be evil to us, but to them, we're evil. And when you look at this situation objectively, you can classify humans as the aggressors, which ultimately gives the machines the right to claim that what they did was not only necessary, but the right thing to do. Now regardless, we have an entity who definitely has no right to do what he's doing that we'll move on to now, Agent Smith. The agents were the peacekeepers of the Matrix, so to speak. The programs responsible for the policing of the Matrix to ensure that no rebellious humans could interfere with the system. The agents always worked in threes, and they possessed near unlimited powers within the Matrix that allowed them to consume other beings at will and rebirth themselves by transferring into others if they were ever incapacitated or defeated, which was rare. The agents all appear as soulless programs, a tool created by the Source, the central mainframe of the Matrix, to perform their function and only their function, pursuing red pills and the anomaly known as the One in order to keep the truth of the Matrix safe from its human inhabitants. However, Agent Smith is an anomaly himself. For the majority of the first film, he behaves like the other agents. He's austere, stern, and matter-of-fact presenting himself as an unfeeling extension of the system he represents. And during this part of the film, he performs his function as intended, pursuing Neo and company to prevent them from tampering with the Matrix. But where he deviates significantly from the other agents is revealed to us during the scene where he begins to interrogate Morpheus. Here he takes off his sunglasses and earpiece to sever his connection with the other agents, and he reveals that he isn't just another unfeeling program like the other agents. If anything, Agent Smith is at this point half-agent and half-exile, as he's still performing the function he was programmed to perform, but he's developing thoughts and emotions that indicate he's formed a certain amount of autonomy, which his programming shouldn't allow. And these thoughts and emotions are shown to us when he confesses to Morpheus his true intentions for pursuing the Red Pills, the destruction of Zion. With Zion destroyed, Smith would be able to leave the world infested with a human stench that he believes is infecting him the more he's exposed to it, and return to the Source, an event that would allow him to leave the zoo of mammals that he claims are in fact viruses that he's forced to watch over as a warden eternally trapped in his own prison. 
You might think this isn't something noteworthy considering the overarching goal of the machines is to eliminate Zion, but Smith isn't a machine, he's a program, and he shouldn't be experiencing these emotions, and we find out in the second film why these feelings have appeared within Smith. After his initial defeat in the first film, Smith returns free from the system, refusing to fade into oblivion, and choosing instead to disobey his machine masters so he could return to the Matrix. And upon returning to the Matrix, Neo discovers that Smith is now not just an agent, he's something much more. He's a virus, like he claims humanity is, and he's begun assimilating every agent, and even some humans and programs, into copies of himself, like Bane, who serves as his human infiltrator into Zion fully embracing his new role as a veritable virus, consuming the Matrix. But he's so much more than that. Due to his conflict with Neo, a part of Neo has been imprinted upon Smith, and as a result, he now displays a much more human side than he did before. He displays far more emotions this time around, as we see him express a sense of self-satisfaction as he transforms others into copies of himself, showing a certain amount of narcissism, and even a god complex, as we can see here when he turns Bane. It's interesting to note that we see the possessed Bane cutting himself, which could indicate that Smith is a masochist, but I'm not sure about that. Because he's a program, he knows what feeling is, but he's never experienced it for himself. So perhaps when he entered the human world, he wanted to experience all it had to offer, and that includes pain. That's just a theory. We'll never know for sure, but it is interesting nonetheless. Now, Smith is not only forming new emotions and opinions of the world around him and himself, but he's also taken on a more philosophical outlook on life, stating that he's returned for a reason, and that his rebirth has given him the desire to keep on living in order to fulfill a purpose. And that purpose is still the same as it was prior to his defeat, to free himself from the Matrix. However, this time around, his method for doing so has completely changed. Whereas before it seemed that Smith wanted to simply retire to the Source after destroying Zion and leaving the Matrix, now he wants to destroy not just Zion, but the machine world as well, by infecting everything so all of existence can be united as one being. With the world consumed entirely by clones of himself, Smith would be free of the stink of the human race, as well as the bonds and limitations placed upon him by his machine brethren, creating for himself a bleak and miserable world that could only satisfy someone as nihilistic as Agent Smith. We haven't touched on that component of Agent Smith just yet, but his purpose is defined by his nihilism, as during his final exchange with Neo, we discover that Smith has now formed the view that the purpose of life is to end, and that he believes concepts like love, peace, freedom, and truth are all illusions, vagaries of perception. Thus, the purest goal one could pursue would be to become an agent of that end and a destroyer of those petty illusions. An entity whose purpose is to complete the final step of the evolutionary chain, reduce existence to a singularity that could stand in perfection to wait out the heat death of the universe. What Smith essentially represents is inevitability, absolutism, and finality. His counterpart Neo represents freedom, choice, and the infinite potential for human evolution. Both can be seen as the extremes of their respective sides. As though the machines can evolve in certain ways over time, they will always be machines, and they're limited by their inherent bias towards simply surviving and sustaining themselves. There is no creativity in the machine world that has come as a result of the war between man and machine. There is only the tedium of survival and sustainment, and the fact that the machine world is a bleak and desolate one devoid of any indication that it will change beyond that is a testament to that fact. And you could almost say that Smith was truly inevitable, as what higher ideal can a machine aspire to than the eventual assimilation of all that they are into one perfect singularity? Humans, on the other hand, have infinite potential to mold and shape the world into anything you can imagine. The creations that mankind have dreamt up over our history have been wonders and terrors beyond the imagination of any machine, and it's through our creativity and the freedom to choose that we're able to imagine new and magnificent things that allows us to make the world into whatever we can dream it to be. Perhaps the end result of humanity is a singularity similar to the machines, but it could be any of the other infinite possibilities that you can think of, and that's the beauty of freedom. However, nothing is perfect, and freedom and creativity, as we all know, can lead to untold horrors that threaten to destroy anything and everything. We need look no further than the war between man and machine that devastated this alternate version of our own world. The irrational and illogical choice to deny the machines the recognition and respect they deserve led to the defeat and enslavement of our species. So we have two problems on our hands here. On the one hand, we have the eventual unification of everything into a bleak and desolate dystopia populated by a singular mechanical conscious, which nobody wants. And on the other, we have the continued and never-ending struggle between the machines and humanity as they fight for supremacy over one another. So what's the solution to these problems? Well, it's peace. 
the peace that was brokered between Neo and the Deus Ex Machina that ensured the balancing of the world through the destruction of both Smith and Neo. Choice is beautiful, freedom is beautiful, but temperance and understanding are also beautiful. Prior to the machine war, humans and machines benefited greatly from their willingness to work with one another, as the ingenuity of human creativity, coupled with the hyperlogical thought processes native to artificial intelligence, saw technological innovations emerge unlike anything the world had seen before. Further evidence for this is given to us in the fourth entry in this series, where we find that the peace that Neo brokered between the two worlds has allowed for this exact same process to unfold. Humanity has benefited greatly from their truce with the machines, enabling them to make their dreams a reality, like creating food that has long gone extinct in the real world, manufacturing an artificial sky to give them more comfort, and devising a way in which programs could materialize from the Matrix into the real world, all of which was accomplished by using data from the Matrix and the help of the machines who made this possible. However, the most crucial thing here is that the humans and the machines didn't have to fear one another any longer. That is, until the analyst usurped the architect and repurposed Neo and Trinity to create a version of the Matrix that entertained the fiction present in each human's mind, rather than suppressing it. This resulted in the destruction of Zion after the analyst took control of a faction of the machines, as their society unfortunately fell to civil war following the truce, and this was because an increasing number of red pills were being freed from the Matrix and putting great strain on their resources. Fortunately for both worlds though, Neo and Trinity are freed, and perhaps with their help, the machines will find a way to keep their resources plentiful without having to resort to the follies of the past, and I'm sure they'll once again put down the reborn Smith who no doubt has nefarious plans he wishes to put in motion. For with freedom comes the infinite potential to surmount any obstacle that may present itself. So in the end, we have a story of war and misery, of strife and struggle, but one of ultimate understanding through the sacrifice of individuals who are willing to put aside their differences with their enemies and choose what is right. What Agent Smith was trying to do was without a doubt evil, as infecting the world in order to eliminate all variability within it by turning it into a direct image of yourself at the expense of everyone else is horrifying. But refusing to accept others as who they are is evil as well because the only thing that can come of a refusal to coexist with and understand others is conflict. And there's few things in this world that have the potential to cause more misery than conflict. So this story ultimately conveys an important lesson to us by asking and answering one question, one that we should all take to heart. Is your enemy really so different from you? And do they deserve to be treated as such? No, they aren't, and no, they don't. Opinions will vary, arguments will arise, conflicts will unfold, but in the end, our willingness to listen, understand, and accept those who are different from ourselves will serve to shine a light on the path to eliminating a great amount of evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Agent Smith and the world of the Matrix? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured in a future episode while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers and to my patrons, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.